Was Jesus really praying not to be crucified? And if so, was it because he was afraid? At first glance, when we read the account of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying three times that this cup be taken away from him, it could to some people seem as though he was afraid of what was going to happen and even more so that he did not want to be crucified, possibly even looking for another way for this to come about. And then he makes another statement on the cross that also kind of clouds the pictures for some people. So before we go to the cross, let's go to the garden and look at what Jesus says. Now he says that in Matthew 26, 36. And by the way, this account has different details added to you, whether you're looking at it from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. John doesn't say a lot about it, but just gives an understanding, a reference to it. But in Matthew 26, 36, he says, Then Jesus came with him to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and two of the sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. And so at this point in time, Jesus understands the gravity of what is going to happen. Now, obviously, he knew that before. We're going to look at that to see that this is not what it looks like. This is not Jesus being kind of unsure or afraid or looking for another alternative. That's not what's happening here. So as we look in verse 39, he says, he fell on his face and prayed saying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you. Now he repeats this three times. So the question is, is he really looking for an out? Well, well, what we have here is a conditional statement. What it really is kind of make it even easier for us to understand is that he is making a statement and phrased in the form of a question. We do that sometimes too. When we make a statement such as, who do you think? We know that, that the answer is implied when we make a statement. Of course, it, you can tell by voice inflection and so forth. But here we have Jesus asking a question, but he's really not asking a question because he already has the answer in mind. He already knows why and what's happening. Remember, there's no one there to hear this prayer that Jesus is making. All of the disciples are off in the distance. As a matter of fact, not only are those three off in the distance, but they're asleep. So they don't get a chance to actually hear because by the benefit of the Holy Spirit speaking to us through these scriptures, we know what was stated, but they don't know what was stated, what was said. We know, we know what was stated. Why? For us to know why these things are happening. He asked, is it possible for this cup to be taken away? Well, so it would trigger a response in us. Is it possible? Well, the answer is no. Remember, Jesus is not unaware of why he came. When he's standing before Pilate, he makes it clear. He says, so as Pilate asked him, so are you the king? Jesus answered and said, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and, I, and for this reason I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus knew why he came in, into the world. He even prepares his disciples for his impending death. Before he goes and prays, he lets them know that the Son of Man will be betrayed and will be killed and will give his life as a ransom. So none of these things caught him off guard. He knew exactly why he came. As a matter of fact, John testifies earlier in the chapter that when he sees Jesus, look, everyone, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Remember what Jesus is doing. Jesus is coming to fulfill the law. What did the law require? The law required a scapegoat, or in this case, a lamb who would take away the sins of the people. The sins of the people would be confessed upon the head of the lamb or the scapegoat and be sent away to a far region. Well, the same thing is going to happen with Jesus. Also, the law required that there be a sacrificial offering whereby the blood is shed to make atonement for the souls of the people. Jesus understands it, so he makes a statement, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Jesus also is not begging for an alternative way as though he sits there powerless. Remember, Jesus is the one who makes a statement. He says in John 10, 18, he says, no one takes away my life. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This is the commandment I received from my father. Now remember, he says that he and the father are one. Jesus is God. However, he is God in flesh here. Why? to atone for sins, to atone for what is required for sin, which is a debt that must be paid in the form of blood. That's why the writer of Hebrews in 10.5 says, therefore, when he comes, that's Jesus, into the world, he says, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. To do what? To shed his blood. Why? For the ransom of many. 
And it was not that Jesus was afraid that Jesus did not um, seek to do this. Again, he did it on his, according to his own initiative, according to his own words. And the, the words tell us, the writer of Hebrews tells us in 12 two, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, look what it says, for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he went with joy, with gladness. He understood full well what was going to happen now. Is it going to be a pleasant experience? Well, obviously not, because this is going to be an event that has never happened before, nor will happen again. This is where the, this is where the father deals with sin and he takes the place of sin. And that is not going to be a comfortable situation, but it is necessary to atone for sins, showing his love for us to take on the punishment of, of sin or in place of us for sin. Similarly, when Jesus is on the cross, he brings up another statement that also can be a little bit confusing. And so we'll address it here. He says, this is in Matthew 27, 46. He says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now he's, re he's repeating what was stated by David, but this is for the king who was going to save people. He says, why have you forsaken me? Again, he's not asking a question because he's confused. He's asking the question or making a statement in the form of a question for the benefit of the hearers. Oh, by the way, they have been scattered. And so through the spirit, they understand what, what's happened. Either Jesus tells them or the Holy Spirit enlightens them to know this. But he asks a question, why have you forsaken me? Well, again, Jesus knows full well why he's been forsaken at this moment, why he is going through this, to pay a debt, an awesome debt, a difficult debt, an expensive debt that's required to atone for the souls of the world. That is his blood being shed. And so it's not that Jesus did not know. He did know. It's not that Jesus was looking for a different route. Clearly, he was there when the decision was that this is how sins were going to be atoned for. Clearly, this plan that God has to save people, Jesus is fully aware of. And so he's not asking a question that he doesn't know. He's not looking for an escape or way out. He is letting us know that he knows full well what he's doing. And again, he does so with joy. So no, Jesus was not afraid of what was happening. Jesus was not looking for a different way for it to come about. And Jesus was certainly not unaware as to why this was happening. He's doing this so that we can answer the question that he's put out. If need be, if we don't know, or at least the search of scriptures, he's doing this because it's necessary and because he loves us because he's the only one that could do it. Amen.